Welcome back to Turpentine VC, a podcast where we discuss the art and science of building successful venture firms, VC to VC. Today's guest likely needs no introduction to a listener of this podcast. Vinod talks about why Kozla's approach is different than most funds and discusses his contrarian thesis in AI, biotech, robotics, crypto, and more. Without further ado, let's dive in. Well, Vinod, thank you so much for, for coming on the podcast. Sure. Happy to be here. Vinod, this has been a big year for you. Uh, o- OpenAI has, has done tremendously well. Uh, you've rehired Keith Raboy at Kosla, and you've, uh, you've done a massive, uh, massive fundraise. Um, but before talking about the, where we are today and where we're going in the future, first, I just want to have you reflect a little bit. It's uh, 20 years since you founded the firm. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the the evolution of the firm? Is this something you could have predicted where you are today? T- talk a bit about the different phases that the firm has undergone. You know, uh, the firm hasn't changed very much. Um, so the two people who joined me in 2006, David Wyden and uh, Samir Call, as senior people, have have been there since then. And since the very you know, other than the first two years when I was operating as a sole investor, uh, the people are the same, David and Samir. Uh, Swen joined about a dozen years ago. He's still there, and and, and Keith joined recently, uh, but he joined before. So the team has been roughly the same team for a very long time. Our mission's the same. We are a little bit different, and I think this – is why I think we are a little bit resilient. Um, We are less in the investing business. I always say we are not investors. Uh, We are much more venture assistance to companies, helping build companies. And frankly, it sort of pains me when entrepreneurs don't realize the difference. Uh, Just yesterday, I had two meetings. um, The CEO of one of our companies, Sword, Four people in Portugal trying to implement his PhD thesis. Um, did uh, I forget if I remember the right numbers? Like twenty uh, twenty two was twenty seven million in revenue. Twenty twenty was like less than one. Twenty two was twenty seven. Twenty three was like seventy five. Uh, and these are just rough. And this year expects 165. Uh, and we had dinner and a strategic conversation about 2027 and 28. And we had these dinners and he flew out from Portugal just for the dinner. Poor guy landed at just before the dinner and left on a red eye uh, to customer meetings in Boston. But he said, he just would do fly out anytime I'm willing to have dinner because the discussion is so different than with his other investors. And they're not like bad investors, just it's different. And the kind of strategic thinking about the future, strategic thinking about staffing. Um, so that's what we focus on at one end, which is how we operate, why we call it venture assistance. I've had helped so many companies change strategies or hire a pivotal person or build a strategic relationship. That's different than what most venture people do. And frankly, most venture people haven't built enough companies themselves to earn the right to advise an entrepreneur on these things. So I don't go to board meetings because I see such terrible advice being dispensed mostly that I don't even go to board meetings. So that's one aspect. The other aspect, which is also very different, is everybody in the firm is there because they care about the mission we are on. Uh, much more care about, you know, when you, if you look at 2004, when I left Kleiner, and I stayed in the Kleiner offices for two years, so I operated my venture firm from within the Kleiner offices. They were kind enough. In fact, when Samir joined me, and then later, David joined me. They gave them all offices. So uh, then we got too big, and they kicked us out. But our focus was science experiments, science and technology making a large impact, uh, not the highest IRR. Uh, 
you know, we have to earn enough of an IRR, uh, but it lets us do these really fun things. And a Samir or a Swain will say they're here for life, uh, whether I pay them or not. Um, because they care about what we are doing, it's not a business. Uh, it's fun. Uh, so those things between our approach of venture assistance and our approach of working on really interesting problems with large technical solutions is different than most firms. Um, how that leads to what you started with, which is open air. In 2018, my conversation with Sam, it was 2018, five years ago. Nobody believed this was a business. It was still, a, you know. Science project. This odd, structured, nonprofit. People worried about that. I said, if you can make AI happen, it's so great for the planet. We're going all in. Uh, by the way, about the same year, we invest in fusion, Commonwealth fusion systems, because that'd be also huge for the planet. Um, and so we take on these very large, impactful things. And if you build a large business, it's hard to not make money in the process. Right? So you focus on building large businesses and you focus on large, impactful things. And the money takes care of itself. You know, my favorite book is Bill Walsh's book, uh, if you haven't, haven't read it, called The Score Takes Care of Itself. You don't win or lose games. You prepare for the games in the right way, work the right way in practice. And the score, it does take care of itself. And the st score is statistical. You win some, lose some. But statistically, if you're better prepared and have a better team, you'll win more than you lose. And that's sort of very much our approach. Because you're betting on the future, how do you make sure that you're not too early? Because being too early can be as uh, as bad as being too uh, you know just incorrect. I don't care. I don't care. We'll stick with it. You know, look, aviation fuels, Lanza Tech. We did that in 2008 or something. Uh, they're now producing aviation fuel. We know aviation fuel is a multi-hundred billion dollar, if not a trillion dollar business. There aren't a lot of sustainable solutions. So we worked on it and it took forever. But, uh, you know, when we invested in fusion in 2018, I didn't know what time frames would work. There was no plan to have a product before 2030s, early 2030s. That was 2018. But... You know, to build something significant takes a lot of effort and a lot of ups and downs. And it's important to realize if you're building something significant, that's what it takes. When we do a GitLab, when you do a Square or an Affirm or a Stripe, but you know, we, we invest in Square, Stripe, and Affirm, we still mostly have a lot of those shares. We didn't sort of look at liquidity and cashing out and like, it's a different approach. Are you building something important over the long term? Stay with it. You know, I still own a bunch of my Google stock from the 1998 IPO. Right. So it's, do you, are you transactional? Do you buy and sell stock? There isn't a single stock I bought and sold the same stock in in the last 10, 15 years. I just don't trade, right? I sort of do things I believe in and stay with it. It's a little bit more of the Warren Buffett-like, believe where the markets are, believe where others are not going, focus on that. To that end, say more about sort of the green tech or, or sort of climate 1.0. Some people see it as a, as a failure. I think you have more nuanced perspective on it. When you talk about sort of uh, that, that that time period and, and where we're at today in, in sort of climate. So if you look, at, you know, we did QuantumScape. It's worth multiple billions today. We did Lancer Tech. It's worth multiple billions today. Um, there's multiple companies. Some we sold in solar and other areas. We sold two battery company quite profitably. They stuck with QuantumScape as the long bat. Uh, so it wasn't as great a return 
as if the market had been exuberant. But even in the crummy markets, we did fine and had decent returns in that fund. So, but mostly because we stayed with it. If I tried to cash out of everything by 2011 or 2012 when things were in the in a funk, uh, we wouldn't have made money. But to us, CleanTech 1.0 was reasonably successful and set us up. Look, we have the best solid state battery company in the planet. We have the best aviation fuel, sustainable aviation fuel company in the planet. We are the best cement company in Forterra. We'll be announcing the largest direct capture, carbon capture facility in the United States uh, later in March or April, a plant in Redding, California. Uh, I could go on. Those are both worth doing in very large markets. And, and they worked out financially well for us because we stayed with them. We weren't market timing for sure. Yeah, it, it's interesting. In the crypto space, you see a lot of people get in when, when it, there's a lot of hype, but then they get in at the wrong time and it all crashes and, and then they leave uh, when, when it's the wrong time to leave and then they miss out on the, on the boon. You, you, here's, here's the philosophy, whether you're a venture firm or an entrepreneur. You have to bet on something that you believe in that the market doesn't believe in. And then stick with it through the ups and downs. For God's sake, I invested in a public transit system. I believe in 25 years, we can replace most cars in most cities. That sounds totally ridiculous. Investing to a venture firm, investing in public transit sounds silly. The first two contracts that we were not invited to bid, that we bid on, we won outright. Um, and we're building a public transit system from San Jose Airport to the new Google campus to the Apple campus. Uh, while you're building one in the East Bay, from the Concord Bot Station all the way to Con Antioch, Concord, uh, Brentwood, Pittsburgh, I forget the four cities. Uh, you have to do contrarian things. Fusion was contrarian when we bet on it. OpenAI was contrarian. We have other contrarian, hugely contrarian bets uh, in uh, AI, even AI, even today. What's contrarian in AI today? Well, what comes after transformers or LLMs? There are new approaches that will be complementary but significant and as important if the thesis is right. And the thesis could be wrong. For example, I'm a huge believer in neurosymbolic computing. I'm a huge believer in probabilistic. I believe they will add significant capability to LLMs. I'm trying it. You, you were writing about AI in 2011 or 2012, you know, more than a decade before everyone else was catching on to it. What, what's something that you've been writing about today or in the last couple of years that is also people just aren't taking seriously yet that in 10 years from now, you know, people will, will be, will, will be talking about just like we're talking about AI today. Yeah. So in 2011, 2012, I wrote about, do we need doctors? Do we need teachers? I, AI doctor, AI tutor. Um, but if you go back just to correct history in the year 2000, there's an interview with me in the New York times that said, when we get AI, we will need to redefine what it means to be human. That's a quote from a 2000 interview. So I've been a long-time believer. I didn't invest in AI between 2000 and 2010, but I tracked it pretty closely. And 2012, I started closing it. My first deep learning investment was in 2014. We did some others. In 2018, we invested in OpenAI. Um, now, some of these other approaches are things... I mean, I, I should say the right answer is investigating, right? Small bets, a million here, two million there, um, and looking at all the alternative approaches. You know, Carl Friston has had a theory of the brain around energy minimization. 
we invested in that idea of just a million bucks six years ago, didn't work. We'll look at it again. We'll look at symbolic computer, symbolic computing. Uh, that's what Rabbit is doing, by the way, build, with agents. Rabbit suddenly gotten popular. We invested a while ago, a year ago. Um, so that's an example of something we are doing. We have similar theses in biotech. We have similar theses in robotics. And so looking at what others aren't looking at is how you make money and sticking with it because you can't predict timing of some of these things. Yeah. How have you approached crypto and, and what are your thoughts on, uh, could you see yourself going big on uh, in that sector or unlikely? So we've approached crypto pretty differently than everybody else. We don't, most crypto investing is crypto for crypto, the crypto world, right? Tools for crypto, trading in crypto, th those kinds of things. I look at the real world uses of crypto. So Helium's a good example. They're building a 5G network to compete with AT&T using crypto. That's a really good use of crypto. We've invested in that. We have a huge bet in WorldCoin. Why global ID is not related to crypto. Global ID is related to a societal need, especially as uh, fraud and other things go up on the internet. And that coin has been exploding because of Sora. And people now think fraud will go up. And so we'll need ID. Uh, but we invest in that because a human ID was an important requirement. And so we invest in that. We invest in Bitwise because it's one of the larger ETFs now. Because Wall Street would want to use it for trading. Not crypto traders in China. But we've stayed away from anything that might be crypto for bad uses. You know, gun trading child trading, drugs, you know, we, so we, we stay pretty much on the clear, we want to be regulatory compliant in that side and have real world applications of crypto, which I think is the proper use of crypto. There is money to be made in other stuff and more money to be made, but I'm less interested in making that money on speculation and other things and timing and getting in and out. Hey, we'll continue our interview in a moment after a word from our sponsors. Over 100 startups launched today. Do you know who they are? If you're not seeing interesting startups, none of your downstream processes matter. How you source deals at the earliest stages could be your most consequential investment. Harmonic is the most complete startup database, finding new companies as soon as they incorporate and tracking them through IPO. You can create a search tailored to your investment thesis. In one search, filter over company data, including venture stage, industry, and geography, founders and operators' backgrounds, and traction metrics like headcount changes, social media audience, and web traffic growth. Importantly, Harmonic instantly surfaces warm connections to help you connect with founders. The results are delivered on autopilot, wherever you most need them, over Slack, email, or via API, directly into your CRM, integrating seamlessly into your software stack. Learn why Craft, Bedrock, NEA, and hundreds more. Trust Harmonic's data by visiting harmonic.ai or use the link in the description. Make sure you mention our podcast, Turpentine VC, during your demo. Hey all, I'm hearing more and more that founders want to get profitable and do more with less, especially with engineering. Listen, I love your 30-year-old ex-fang senior software engineer as much as the next guy, but honestly, I can't afford them anymore. Founders everywhere are trying to turn to global talent, but boy, is it a hassle to do at scale, from sourcing to interviewing to on-the-ground operations and management. That's why I teamed up with Sean Lanahan, who's been building engineering teams in Vietnam at a very high level for over five years to help you access global engineering without the headache. Squad, Sean's new company, takes care of sourcing, legal compliance, and local HR for global talent so you don't have to. With teams across Asia and South America, we can cover you no matter which time zone you operate in. Their engineers follow your process and use your tools. They work with React, Next.js, or your favorite front-end frameworks. 
And on the back end, they're experts at Node, Python, Java, and anything under the sun. Full disclosure, it's going to cost more than the random person you found on Upwork that's doing two hours of work per week but billing you for 40. But you'll get premium quality at a fraction of the typical cost. Our engineers are vetted top 1% talent and actually working hard for you every day. Increase your velocity without amping up burn. Head to choose squad.com and mention Turpentine to skip the wait list. I want to return to your idea of venture assistance and ask you to think about how you've structured your team to build, the, to deliver the best, the best assistance possible to entrepreneurs, both in terms of what type of people that, that you look for, what sort of re recruiting lessons uh, you've, you've learned over time, but then also how you just think about team construction, i.e. the best use of your fees to best structure the teams so that you could best, best serve entrepreneurs because lots of firms do it very differently. Yeah. So first, you know, why did Keith come back? That's a good place to start. Because he likes working with entrepreneurs. And nothing wrong with Founders Fund. It's a very good fund. They've had a stellar track record. But they are hands off. Right? They invest and then they let the entrepreneurs be. Uh, Keith is much more hands on. In fact, he was one of the founders of Open Door. He started companies of his own. He was early in Square. Before that, um, he worked for Max Levchin at a company we had invested in that got sold to Google. He had a long relationship with Keith, but he's an operator. And so he can help an entrepreneur very differently than a board member from an investing firm, right? He can, you watch his interviews, he has nuanced understanding of what an entrepreneur goes through. And I was just talking to my old chief of staff yesterday. He left, he was chief of staff for three years, which is a typical assignment for my chief of staff. And then I helped them start a company, he started a company. And he said, he, he didn't understand what I meant when I said, you don't have empathy for entrepreneurs till you've gone through the ups and downs of starting a company. And I feel like I have better empathy. And that doesn't mean I'm nice to entrepreneurs. It doesn't. I treat them like my kids. Some things I agree, some things I disagree, and I push them on. But I want them to succeed just like I want my kids to succeed. If I say yes to everything, like a lot of firms do to uh, entrepreneurs, it is bad for them. It is truly bad if you just try and be their friend and say yes to everything. Instead of giving them the honest truth, tell them, here's a problem they'll run into in two or three years. You know, we had a company called Poly AI doing extremely well in the UK. Does customer so service uh, with voice AI. I had to push them a while ago to say LLMs are important. Switch. Because they already had a functioning system, they had customers, and the founder swears by, if I hadn't pushed him, he would never have done it, and it'd be too late by now. So the company got saved because of a strategic discussion. Then I pushed him on hiring certain types of people. Uh, first time entrepreneur, in retrospect, uh, uh, he loves the fact that I push him, and he's much bigger and more successful than he would have been. And that's what I call venture assistance. Keith came back because he loves doing that and can help entrepreneurs. It's, you know, if a typical, typical VC tries to do that, they've not built multiple billion dollar companies with founders. They haven't gone through the downs a founder goes through. But it's very hard for them to give relevant advice. In fact, I found it so frustrating to watch the bad advice dispatched by board members. I stopped going to board meetings. I generally don't go to board meetings anymore. I'll do one-on-ones with the founders and try and help them. And that's why I say most VCs act neg negative value. You know, just uh, we, we just had a company called Robin Go Under, uh, scribing for physician offices. Three years ago, I invested, uh, and 
I said, I'll invest, help you look at AI to do scribing. Their board focused just on revenue, not on building the tools to have a competitive cost structure. So guess what happened? Four years later, they had revenue and zero margin. So they actually came back to me and said, uh, will you take the lead here and do a technology insertion? But it was too late. It was too late in a business that would have been a phenomenal business. And that's one that didn't take my advice because the board was focused on revenue. What are other examples of advice that may look like okay advice to other people, but looks like bad advice to you? Well, I'll tell you my dinner last night with the founder of So. You know, they're, they're a substantial sized company. Uh, and, you know, they should be pre- prepping to go public sometime in the next couple of years and all that. And boards do that. And I said to him, if you show profitability, you're admitting you have no great investment opportunities. Think about it. Profitability, I said, be close enough to cash flow break even. You never need to depend on outside capital. That's really good advice. But maximizing profitability is an invest, uh, admission of guilt that you don't have great investment opportunities. And if you're looking at 2024 or 2025, yes, you can optimize profitability at the expense of products and services that might go, cause you to grow faster in 26 and 27. So I said, set 27 in your goal, maximize growth and even profitability by that time frame. But don't focus on this year or next and don't admit you don't have opportunities to invest another 10 here or 20 million there. Okay? And a good example, You know, he added a service called Bloom. Two years ago, we had a dinner similar to this. And I said, you've got to look past your basic business, which is growing very rapidly, to what comes next. If he had focused on profitability, he wouldn't have invested. It's about 20% of his business to a year and a half after launch. By the way, same thing happened to Square Cash. The general board advice on Square Cash was focus. You're a small business company, not a consumer company. Square Cash is consumer. It's most of their market cap today. But the board wanted to give sensible advice of focus, which is really bad advice most of the time. Of course, focus and lack of focus is a very nuanced thing. You can't say don't be focused. That's bad advice. You can't say be focused. It's nuanced. And that's what I mean by venture assistance and why this is so much fun and hopefully so much more valuable for entrepreneurs. And that's why I think founder VCs are so much better off in their ability to advise an entrepreneur because they've gone through the experience. So if you're an entrepreneur, besides looking for someone who's built a company before, how else are you determining who to take advice from? And similarly, when you're looking to hire partners, there are a lot of people who built big companies before, or how are you determining which of the ones would be great assistance to entrepreneurs versus not? I tell founders, look at how many billion dollar companies has somebody helped build. Okay. From scratch, not join Google or Facebook and take a, a business internally. That's not entrepreneurship. You don't have to worry about your paycheck and, when, when you worry about your paycheck and when you can't hire somebody because you're going to convince them to draw, drop a big paycheck at Google uh, Meta and come to you and you feel guilty about that because you're not sure you can get your next financing together, that's pain. That's when you learn empathy for entrepreneurs. Mm. Um, so I, I, I think... Uh, what I tell people is who's gone through building that? Who's gone through assembling teams that are unusual? So if you look at a simple fact, there, I've done innovation only for 40 years. I can't think of one example of large innovation that came from an existing company or from somebody who knew the area. I would submit 
if Elon Musk had been in the auto industry, Tesla would never be born and the world wouldn't be on an electric car path today. Same thing. If Brian Chesky had worked at Hilton, he'd never do Airbnb. Uh, so you want to be outside your domain. And most board members advise get somebody who understands the domain as a CEO or something. That's really bad advice generally. You want somebody who from, can think from first principles and learn the business rapidly in six months and be much better off than who's been somebody who's been in the business for 20 years. Right? Um, you look for completely different characteristics in a hire uh, if you've really been an entrepreneur and understand what it takes. So you look at really great entrepreneurs like, say, Pat, Patrick Collison and John Collison. They hire very differently than somebody who's been in the industry for 30 years from Bank of America, which is most what most board prescribe. That's one small example. How to think about investment or profitability versus investment opportunities. I gave you that example. Uh, how to think about risk or burn rate and how to manage it. They're, they're all nuanced things entrepreneurs learn or learn after the fact and say, I wish I'd known that. For example, your biotech practice, is that you getting smart on bio? Is that you hiring a, a, someone to lead that practice internally? Or how are you able to invest in these spaces that require a lot of domain expertise? It's both. You know, you need a combination of some expertise. We have a great bio group, but we have an unusual bio group. They take digital health. We, we probably had the most successful companies in digital health. We knew nothing about digital health, but nobody did. And people from, who came from healthcare to do digital health generally failed at it. When, when you look back at running Kosla and building this, this organization, you, you've done a lot of things tremendously well and have a lot of outcomes to show for it. But what are things you either wish you did differently or certain things you wish you did sooner that, uh, that other entrepreneurs could, can, can learn from? You know, so I just want to give uh, elaboration on my last example. Digital health didn't exist. We did it differently. When we talk about cell therapy or cell engineering. We have deep expertise. You know, the founder of Intelia, the person who did the first gene therapy um, company is on our team. They can help at a very different level. Uh, to your question, I say, you know, if I look over the years, there's nobody in the venture business who's failed more often than I have failed. Okay. I've just tried many more things and screwed up more, more often than most people. And then a small, tiny percentage become the big visible successes. Right? So understanding even more starkly that venture is really asymmetric. So you don't want to take low risk. You want to take very high risk. When we invest, I assume we lost the money the day we invest. And then I maximize for the upside. I don't try and protect that investment. And even now, I fall back into this, hey, we got 20 million invested here. Let's, you know, sometimes play the safeguard. Venture is all about the upside opportunity. How do you make it asymmetric? So you can lose one times your money, but if you can make uh, 50 times your money, one out of 10 or one out of 20 times, you'll do fine. And people don't understand what venture is. And I have to keep clarifying even to myself. We are not in the investing business. We've not computed an IRR on the investment last 10 years, ever, that I can think of. Maybe somebody has somewhere in our shop, but I, I, I discourage people from looking at it or computing IRRs. We are buying an option. So if I were to explain venture financially, we are buying an option, open AI and AI can be bid. And we buy an option with a great team and then you help them succeed. 
Same thing in fusion or public transit or a new kind of protein when we did impossible food. And why do you discourage that? So it's, I call it option value investing is what we do, not IRR investing. And is the problem with IRR investing that it discourages risk-taking or you're too cautious? Absolutely. And it's, uh, you know, it's deluding yourself because IRRs are not computable given the wide range of outcomes and timings. So it's delusional. It's internal justification. It's not reality. It's f- false precision. Yeah. It's interesting. You, you, you say you failed more than, uh, than anyone else, but I, I, it, it just speaks to the asymmetricness of it where I can name a bunch of your big wins, but I, I can't name them. Well, let me give you an example that I love. Uh, you you said you watched a lot of my interviews, read up with me. Do you know my first two startups or three startups? Um, I, I know I know Sun, but I, I don't know the the ones be- before them. Okay, here's my point. The same time, the same month, I started Sun. I started another company with the same co-founder McNeely, called the Data Dump. And I would say nobody ever knows I started that and failed at it uh, because failures don't matter. People remember the successes and the returns come from the successes. Now, I'd done a company before then called Daisy Systems, which, by the way, went public, was very successful. But people don't remember that because Sun was a much bigger success. And so... uh, but data dump was started at the same time with the same co-founder, and it failed abysmally, and nobody remembers. It's I don't even think it's on Wikipedia. <laughs> yeah. So uh, my my point is, it's the asymmetric things that stand the test of time. You know, everybody remembers I invested in OpenAI. I was the first venture investor in OpenAI. Nobody remembers. Two years, three years before that, we invested in a little thing called uh, Order of Magnitude Labs to commercialize Carl Fersen's, Fersen's thesis on um, on energy minimization and the way the brain works, uh, and it failed. Who cares? I lost a million and made billions. That's an okay trade-off. I can let, lose a million a hundred times. How have you thought about the the fund size in terms of you know you you have a global uh you know mandate should you have teams um all, all over the world or how, how have you thought about coverage in terms of geography so we are not trying to be the largest fund in the world we are not trying to be global we're trying to have a lot of fun working with technology based startups that have a lot of impact like that's Technology-based economic disruption is our mission, which is fun. But with positive social impact, very much what our mission is. We are not trying to be a Blackstone. We are not trying to be funds under management. We are not trying to raise the maximum money we can. That's not our goal. So how do we decide? This year, last year, what did we do? Most firms were raising smaller funds. We decided we'd be aggressive because AI is a big area. Robotics is a big area. Climate will be a big area again. It's happening. Bio is opened up. Biotechnology has so many opportunities um, because we are starting to operate at the level of precision. So um, I can define food as in a really interesting area. Um, Uh, So if you look back in November or look on my Twitter profile and hit highlights, I have 11 predictions for the planet that most experts would disagree with. Predictions are easy if you predict what everybody else is predicting. I have 11 predictions that very few people agree with today. Are we working on all 11? Um, And if I'm right, that changes the world very dramatically. Um, so how does that relate to fund size? We thought it was time to be aggressive in these areas. And I'll come back to why I think the next 10 years or 20 years is the best time in the venture capital. Um, there's these 11 predictions. 
And the best things that happened for venture, as unfortunate as they were, was Ukraine, which set the world on a path to energy independence, as unfortunate as it is. And COVID proved to us our China dependence, which means all minerals, metals, supply chains, manufacturing will move out of China over the next decade, or at least diversify significantly. Those are so Ukraine, COVID, and AI are massive turbochargers for venture. Right? This is not how the world looks at it. They're looking at short term, what happened to interest rates, what happened to GDP growth. I look at what will happen, what companies will be created in 10 and 20 years. If I buy that uh, and health permitting, I'll be working on them for the next 20, 25 years. I'm 69. Warren Buffett's still working, so I have a role model. Um, I'm passionate about these. Uh, and this is not about IRR. So for that, we upsized our seed fund, but not that much, from 300 to 400 million. We upsized our main firm from a billion to a billion and a half. And then we added a growth fund. Because people are not investing in the things we believe in, because we don't do traditional. I can get people to invest in public transit. When it's a complete no more, it's so far superior to self-driving cars in every possible way uh, that it should be a no-brainer. New kinds of protein sources to replace corn and soy, it should be a no-brainer. And we're working on these. Um, AI, of course, uh, I think there'll be a billion bipedal robots in 20, 25 years. That's a business that'll be created from scratch, that'll be bigger than the auto industry. Anybody saying that to you? So these are fundamental beliefs, long-term beliefs, just like I was giving you the example of AI in the year 2000, and I didn't do anything for 10 years because there wasn't the right time. And in 2013, 2014, we started to actually invest. Our first deep learning startup was in 2014. It's not Johnny come lately. Last year, I was investing in crypto, and this year, AI is hot, so I moved to crypto. It's a very different approach to venture, um, and a lot more fun as, an, as a venture capitalist. By the way, in 40 years, I've not once called myself a venture capitalist. I say I'm a venture assistant to entrepreneurs, helping them build better companies. We'll link to your, your predictions Let's talk about the the world uh, the role that people play in the economy in a in a fully AI sort of uh, driven world. Um, you, you say people work because they they want to work. W what will they do? You, you also say that we'll we'll have UBI, but I'm curious why not just focus on l lower price l l the lower prices of you know food, healthcare, and you you probably would say both. But um, it, talk more about the role of people in in, in the future economy. So this weekend, uh, this coming weekend, I'm attending a small, small group seminar on the economic implications of AI. It's two days of the economic implications. I'm very interested. I think for the next decade, AI will be quite deflationary, starting in two or three years, when AI applications start to have an impact. I think AI will start increasing GDP growth and will go from 2% to 4%. So people would normally predict 2% GDP growth over the next 50 years. I will say it'll average 4%. And that's a huge implication. Per capita GDP would triple over 50 years if that happened or uh, over 100 years. I forget the calculation. You can calculate it. Large implications. So what will people do is the most common question. First, the next 10 years will look like GDP growth and productivity growth, and people will be part of that equation. I think for people who are between, uh, say, 30 years old today, in 25, 20 years, they'll be 50 years old, they will have a hard time adjusting because their job defines them. But I would submit it's not a lot of fun 
to be an assembly line worker at GM, putting a tire on a car eight hours a day for 30 years in a row. That's not, that's human slavery in drudgery. It's not a meaningful job. Yes, it does pay the paychecks and so people do it, but it's slavery to the industrial complex. Um, I think we will free people from those kinds of jobs and my bipedal robots will be doing those jobs. <laughs> so what will people do? 50-year-olds will have, in 20 years, will have a hard time adjusting. Today's 30-year-olds take note. A baby born today, 10 years from now, will be brought up that education is not to get a job. Almost most kids are brought up today, whether you're in India or in the U.S., to study so they can get a job. Um, I think that bond will be broken. Six-year-olds will learn that they get to express their creativity and pursue their passions because jobs isn't going to be the key criteria for education. They will be free from that. There will be enough GDP and per capita GDP to share broadly. And remember, capitalism is by permission of democracy. And democracy will be just the rules of capitalism. Um, so my view is early schooling is when people will learn. Education isn't about a job. It's about pursuing a passion. Uh, if you want to compete in the Mavericks surf competition or the X Games or the America's Got Talent or I, I think human uniqueness will still be valued. Humans will become substantially more creative with the use of AI. And Scott Belsky had in his Implications blog a really good blog recently that said, what matters is taste. What will matter most in the world of AI, because AI will do a lot of things, will be the taste, the human curation, the human selection, the human preference for something. And I think it's hard to predict it precisely, but roughly that direction is right. And humans will pursue passions that they like not pursue to do an assembly line GM job at GM for 30 or 40 years, assembling tires or cars or some other godforsaken part eight hours a day for 30, 40 years till they get a back problem and then they're on disability. Yeah. It, it, it seems like the areas where there will be more people labor than maybe we expect are, are maybe areas that are highly regulated and will thus demand that we, uh, you know, hire maybe like healthcare, for example, even if the, the technology is so much better, it might just be slow to, to let humans get out of the system or in areas where, for whatever reason, humans will bias other, other human involvement, even if uh, it doesn't make sense. Humans will prefer human element, uniqueness. We still prefer handcrafted in X country over manufactured in China all day long. And that's the emotional parts of humans that will see a lot more fulfillment and expression and creativity. So, so short term, it will be sort of, it will help people. It'll be sort of the co-pilot uh, model, medium, long term, it will get better than people and, re and replace them, but uh, you know, provide enough GDP so that they can do uh, other things that maybe they want to enjoy, even if it's not adding more GDP into the economy. But society, look, political systems will have to adjust. Capitalism was the right political system since Adam Smith for economic efficiency. And efficiency, man, was critical because resources were scarce. And so you had to be efficient in every, you know, I look at Timu and you can directly ship a piece of clothing from a factory in China directly to a consumer, cut out the supply chain, and hence you can sell a piece of clothing for five bucks that would cost 50 otherwise. That's economic efficiency. 
And capitalism is great for economic efficiency and increasing total goods and services produced. But two things are happening. Capitalism is more being used for demand creation now, convincing you you need to not buy that $20 pair of jeans, Levi's. You need to buy that $200 pair of jeans. It's demand creation. Um, But also when AI makes abundance easy, efficiency becomes less less important, at least Income equality will become at least as important as economic efficiency, maybe more important. And I wrote about in 2016 in a blog I wrote uh, in, I forget it was Forbes or Fortune, called AI Will Cause, that was 2016. I've been on this theme for a long time. AI will cause great abundance, great productivity growth, great GDP growth, everything economists measure, and increasing income disparity. That was my piece from 2016, I believe. You can link to it uh, and find it. But that's really important to understand. And, And social policy and democracy can correct the flaws of capitalism. Do you think we'll have a more centrally planned economy? Do you think we'll have a more centrally planned economy as a result? No. I don't think that's the answer. Centrally planned economies revert to the mean. Uh, We will see even more distribution, even more customization, even more niches in every part of the world. And, you know, humans will pursue a passion that will be valued. I'm curious, given your plentiful entrepreneurs you have on on your team and, and your sort of founder abilities, why don't you also incubate companies in the same way that uh, Sam Altman does or, or Elon Musk does and where they identify a, a big... We do. You do. Okay. We do incubate companies. You know, Impossible Foods was incubated. I have 10 companies I could point to that were incubated by us. Even QuantumScape was sort of incubated in our shop. Jigdeep Singh was working in our shop. Not... as Right... So we do incubate. In fact, we have a separate building next door that's for incubation. And we are one of the few firms that has a high-level operating team to help our entrepreneurs and help do incubations. So we do all that. And, you know, we don't, we don't have an army of operating people. We have very high-quality operating people. And my view is there's very few startups that can afford a uh, $600,000, $700,000 VP of engineering. So we have the CTO of GitLab on our operating team and he can advise entrepreneurs on how to do engineering or the head of design for Google. Uh, and a startup couldn't afford that, but they can help advise an entrepreneur. So that's venture assistance. We, we have a salesperson who's very senior who can advise people on how to build a sales team. Is, is there some thinking around what are the types of ideas you would invest in versus what are the types of ideas you'd incubate? Or is it more organic, whether if the people have a good idea and want to incubate it, you incubate it? With, yeah. Look, whenever there's an entrepreneur with a big idea, we'll always invest in the entrepreneur. Incubations are much harder, um, much easier to invest in the entrepreneur. But if something's important and not being done, we'll incubate it. Talk about you and your, your durability, because that, that's one of the other, uh, you know, you can only uh, benefit from, from failing a few times and su- then succeeding if you keep, uh, keep swinging. There, you, you love what you do. You're going to do it for the rest of your life. But a lot of people listening love what they do and, and think they'll do it for, for a long time, but they, but they won't. W- what's, what separates you in the way that you live that other people can learn from that allows you to operate at such a high level for so long? You know, I gave a talk at Stanford. Uh, to the business school class in 2015 and gets referred to a lot, even now. And I literally, in an audience of four or 500 people, I said, I'm not speaking to most of you, but I hope that a few percent of you, far less than 5%, will make more difference than the remaining 95% by driving a change. If I can convert one or two people 
in this audience or one or two percent even better uh, to thinking about the world differently, uh, then I will have successfully used my hour in that talk. And I haven't listened to it recently, but um, most people are driven externally. What kind of car they drive, what do the neighbors think, what kind of house they own. I've always been driven internally. What do I want? I don't care about a VP title somewhere or that I'm on the board of Square uh, I, uh, or you know, I got off the week before the IPO because I don't want the hassle of an IPO uh, of a public company. Um, I don't go on boards. because I don't need that ego benefit. What I do like is making a difference. And that is like playing a chess game with a consequence. Right? All of us like to win at games but much more meaningful to win if it's consequential. Um, so I'm internally driven. Most people are externally driven. What do their neighbors think, friends think, parents think, what's expected of them, uh, right? So, uh, you know, I started my first startup, Daisy, the, the same month I got married and literally didn't even have a place to sleep, uh, couldn't put the deposit down uh, to rent an apartment. That was fine. I knew what I wanted to do. And, and so I think if people stop thinking about what others expect of them and what they want for themselves, they'll be passionate about something. And it um, doesn't matter. It may be about training a whale. I think that's an incredibly hard thing would be really meaning. I'd love to train animals uh, to do things. I love animals. That's meaningful to me. Um, but helping entrepreneurs build really consequential technology companies is something I can do uniquely well and I have some skills in. And so I love doing it. And why do it's so much better than uh, so much more fun than playing golf or sailing? So much more fun and motivating, right? So, you know, but I'm fine if somebody wants to excel at golf and they want to be really, really good at it. And that's their passion. So, you know, it comes back to AI will free us even more to do follow our passions. Mine happens to be this. Uh, and so I, I can't see doing something different. Uh, I have a document I put out in the public domain called Reinventing Societal Infrastructure by te uh, by, with Technology. I wrote it after I turned 60 and said, what do I want to do for the next 25 years? At 69, I'm still thinking the next 25. I didn't understand the math of subtracting nine years. But I wrote a 50-page document on the problems I want to work on. I took three months off, went to my ranch, and hiked a lot, and wrote a lot, and thought a lot. And laid out, I thought I'd find one area that'd be interesting. And I find, found that there was no area of GDP, non-governmental GDP especially, that couldn't be innovated radically with technology. And so I made it my business and said, oh, this sounds fun to work on. And it's a passion. Yeah. And and. We'll link to the, the the document you just mentioned. It still holds up, you know, tremendously well nine years later, and you're you're just getting started in some ways. Yeah, I'm, we're still investing on that thesis, and I find it much more motivating to me than if I took up knitting or gardening or golf or sailing. And not that there's anything wrong with any of those things. It's just what do what you have passion for. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a great note to to end on. Uh, You've, uh, you've been an inspiration to me and to, and to many of us. Uh, Vinod, thank you so much for, for coming on the podcast and sharing your lessons with us. Well, great. I love talking to entrepreneurs. Thank you. Turpentine VC is a podcast from Turpentine, the network behind Moment of Zen and Econ 102. If you liked the episode, please leave a review in the Apple Store or rate us on Spotify. Hey everyone, Eric here. At Turpentine, we're building the first media outlet for tech people by tech people. We're the network behind the show you're listening to right now. 
We have a slate of hit shows across a range of topics and industries, from our AI and investing cluster of podcasts to shows that drive the conversation in tech with the most interesting thinkers, founders, investors, and influencers, like Econ 102 with Noah Smith. We're launching new shows every week, and we're looking for industry-leading sponsors. If you think that might be you and your company, email me at erikaterpentine.co. That's E-R-I-K at turpentine.co, and let's partner together. 